Han Meditation. Oh, you know, Hinduism and Vedanta, of course, does have concepts of heaven and hell. The idea is that there are different planes of existence, our human mortal plane, which we are experiencing right now, being one of them. And there are better, more pleasant planes of existence, and this is, these are what are called heavens. So it's not just one heaven. In fact, Vedanta talks of seven heavens, and it's not just one hell. Vedanta talks about seven hells. So there are 14 <laughs> worlds, some of which are better than this world and some of which are worse than this world. And the human soul goes to these worlds depending on karma. Lots of good karma and you can go to heavens and higher heavens yet. And bad karma, I'm afraid there are different hells which we can be put into. But Vedanta, the essential message, message of Vedanta is that these heavens and hells are not permanent. They are not necessarily our goal and they are in fact not real. What Vedanta tells us is that our real self, existence, consciousness, bliss, this is the only reality that is and that manifests as these different planes of existence. The purpose of life in this plane of existence and in fact all life, the purpose is to find out who we really are. The purpose is not to go to heaven and certainly not to go to hell. It is to stop going to heaven and hell. That is how the Hindus define liberation, freedom. The more I hear about Vedanta, the more I love it. I, I keep saying it, but it's really true. That's why I'm really trying to spread the message on Vedanta. So share the video, share the content, because we're going to be going hard on just learning as much as we can and, and spreading this information. But it's like we have these videos lined up where we're going to talk about Vedanta and hear Swami talk about it. And then we say something in the, in the video before, and then he says it in the next video and deeply clarifies on it. So if you guys want to watch our previous videos, please continue to watch them because this is the most interesting stuff I've ever heard. I mean, we were just talking about heaven and hell and that when we we're taught in our Christian beliefs that other religions would go to hell for eternity if they didn't believe in Christianity mm -hmm. or Jesus or God or, or whatever they teach that we never thought that that was true and he explained it perfectly where he said that in Vedanta there are seven heavens and seven hells it just sounds like different dimensions of reality and they're not permanent and that's not your goal and the only true reality is the one where you, the bliss and love and that's your true self. And that is so realistic and so honest and so pure that that's exactly what we believe in. And if you're an enlightened being or trying to be on the path of enlightened, that's what most people believe in, that there are different realities and different levels that are more negative than this earth. And there are different places that are extremely more positive than this earth. And so you could classify those as heaven and hell, but those are not permanent places that you just go to and that you're there forever, for eternity, to never escape from these places. So that's just something that people have to think about. This isn't somewhere that you're just forever just trapped and you can't get out. No, this is somewhere that your soul is going to go to learn based on your karma and karma is not what people think it is. But if you're constantly doing bad things, then you're going to have to atone then you're going to have to learn your lessons in one way or one form or another. And yeah. if you're constantly putting out good and positivity into the world, then you're going to be somewhere that's going to reflect that in your soul. Yeah. And it's really interesting because the ancient Mayans, they actually had a similar belief where they saw earth as the middle ground neutral plane. And I can't remember if it was seven, but it definitely was a set number, maybe nine gotta look over my notes but they also believed of the hell levels and the higher heaven levels and you would travel through them or make your way through them so that's a pretty interesting connection right there and I know also in Buddhism I learned in an ancient Asian philosophy class from college was my favorite class I ever took super interesting that the Buddhists believe that heaven and hell also are just planes of existence but they are both accessible here on earth while we are here so heaven is nirvana and hell is hmm 
leave it in the comments if you know. I can't quite remember. I think it's Dharma, maybe. That sounds right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I know Dharma is something, but I don't know if that's what it is. But yeah, you will go to Nirvana or Dharma just based on your own enlightenment, just based off your own being that you are. And I do see that as a possibility as well, because we are every single millisecond traveling through billions of different realities and it is up to us to determine which reality we'll go to based off our own vibration we're putting out and our thoughts so very interesting thing but also after death there's something that goes on and if you look at things like christianity where if you think about it they almost have it right they're almost there because they believe that we are eternal which is true our soul never ever dies but as we know in the ancient times the rulers of christianity started getting fear put into there and they created this eternalness as a fearful type thing and it's not fearful at all and just because you go somewhere you're not just going to go somewhere after you die but you will live forever and that's a beautiful thing not something to be feared yeah just tell your name tell your name and uh Shutanu, yes yes and then in a small thing we lose and we feel like we are going back to zero yeah is self really something or what is the way out yeah question Shutanu asked is very important we practice something then we stop whatever it is so is it last we feel frustrated after some time or is something saved if you look at this theory vritti and samskara what you practice consciously you think certain things say certain things and do certain things that is added it's never lost arjuna in the sixth chapter of the bhagavad gita he asks this question krishna you're telling me to practice meditation spiritual practices and all but suppose I don't get jnana in this life, if I don't get spiritual realization in this life, then have I lost both this worldly life and also spiritual life? I did not get that realization, Atma, Jnana, Nirvana, Moksha, whatever, and I did not enjoy life in this world. I have given up certain things in this world. Have I lost both? Ubhaya uh, Vibhrashta. From both sides, I am lost. And Krishna gives a clear answer Nahi Kashchid. Kalyana Krita, Kachit Durgatim Tata Gachati. Kalyana Krita, person who walks on the path of spirituality, uh, spiritual welfare, he never goes to destruction. So, this is always added up. If you practice something, let it go, fine. It is there. Next time you practice, whatever you have practiced earlier comes to your aid. So, you get up at 5 o'clock and hold on to it for at least 21 days. What it does is it becomes a habit. So, habit has its own inertia. Then it becomes easier to wake up after that uh, at, at 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the morning. If you do for 2-3 days and abandon it, it becomes equally, it remains equally difficult. It is like if you want to jump across a ditch, you have to take one big jump. You cannot take few small jumps because you fall in the ditch if you try to do that. So, you want to make a new habit, you have to push for 21 days. 21 days is just a figure, one month. So, both ways, what you do, it is saved, but it is better to do it for, hold on to it and do it for some time. Yeah. So, what he's saying is absolutely true because whenever you want to start a new habit, you have to start doing it consistently. You just have to push through. It's not always going to be easy, but you just have to make it a part of your life. If you want to lose weight and start working out, you can't just go to the gym once. You got to start going to the gym every single day or at least a few times every single week. You have to keep that pattern going. You have to make an effort to start working out. Same thing with meditation and spiritual practices. You have to make time for it. We're actually reading The Course of Miracles and he, the, in The Course of Miracles, the lesson said that exact same thing that Swami said, where it was talking about meditating for 30 minutes in gratitude to God. And when you're meditating in 30 minutes of gratitude to God, it was saying that don't worry about if you got a message from God now or whatever, but this will always come back to you. It will come back to you in time. And that's how I feel about downloads of information and getting spiritual information because the downloads will come to you in time.
Whenever they're meant to come, they will come. Don't worry about it. Don't have an insistence or resistance on it. Just know that in the perfect amount of time, this information will be there for you, stored in your brain, and it will come to you perfectly. So just know that and have that faith and just keep working on what you need to work on consistently and practicing it every single day. So do you agree with that, Kelly? Do you think that you should be practicing things consistently on a consistent basis? And do you believe that it takes about 30 days to really get into this practice? Yeah, I've been hearing that for years since I was in middle school. I remember one of the my teachers said that, that an average it takes 21 days to form a habit. And that's just the way it is. Of course, it's not exact, maybe a little more, a little less, depending on what it is, depending on the person. But that is about right. And his metaphor, I've never heard it put that way before, but that was really, really good saying that if you're going to jump over a ditch, you have to really boom, push. You can't just take little steps. The fear of discomfort is like a plague. It keeps so many people stuck and complacent with where they are when they know they need to make this jump they know they need to do this they know their life would be better if they just do it and it happens all 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 the time that people don't want to make that one big jump that one big uncomfortable jump it could be a pile of gold on the other side but they are so afraid to make that one uncomfortable jump it really is a real thing and it just comes down to you You just have to push yourself to do it. And once you do it, it feels so much better. And you can even see that with small things. You know, we all procrastinate on little things here and there. We come up with little excuses in our head. We do little, te we do little things that we're comfortable doing oh to keep ourselves busy so we feel like we're doing something and that's why we can't get to that. But when it comes to making big jumps that the only reason you're not doing it is because of the discomfort. You have to just push yourself. And that's where discipline comes in. You have to have good discipline in yourself because you have to you have to respect yourself enough to do it for yourself. Yeah, it's important not to be in a fearful mind state or not to be scared of discomfort. My principle number nine is change is always constant. So it's OK to be uncomfortable because you're going to be comfortable later. It's OK to be scared now because you're not going to be scared later. So don't ever let these uh, false beliefs, these false states of mind, limit your choice, limit your decision making, or prohibit you from doing something that can benefit you in the long term or prohibit you from following your heart and your dreams. Yeah. And going back to having fear that if you're, you know, learning enough spiritually, at the end of the day, you got to look yourself in the mirror and you know deep in your heart if you're doing all you need to do, everything you know you can do to advance to where you want to be. So when it comes to spiritual practice, if you feel in your heart that you need to wake up at 5 a.m. and have the first hour meditating, journaling, whatever you feel like you need to do, though that's what you need to do. You can only control what you need to control and the rest will follow through. You know in your own mind what you need to do and what you need to handle and the rest will be taken care of by God in the universe. And it's just like anything, practice makes perfect. You're showing up to do that practice every single day. An athlete isn't expecting to get all they want from one practice, from seven practices, from a year of practice. But when the game time comes, they know they've done all that practice and that they'll be ready. Or if they didn't practice enough, maybe they won't be ready. But again, that's on them. They have to look at themselves in the mirror every, every night. So you just have to do all you can do and leave the rest to God. Vedanta is not only religion, it is the core of all religions. Let me explain that. Vedanta holds that in our truest nature, we are one with God. The famous Vedantic saying, Tat Tvam Asi, that thou art. Here, that stands for God. So our true nature, the true nature of all human beings is divinity itself. Now, there are religions which are God-centered. So, in, there are many forms of Hinduism, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktaism, the worship of Vishnu, of Shiva, of the Mother Goddess, which are centered around the worship of God in different names and forms. Other religions too, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they are all God-centered. So, you believe in God, worship God in the hope and in the faith that uh, uh, in this life or after death you attain to God. 
There are other religions which seem very different, like Buddhism or Jainism or the Sankhya and Yoga traditions in Hinduism, where God is either not talked about at all or talked about just in passing. Those, those approaches, they concentrate on the self, where the search is not for God, but for the truth within ourselves. The question is, who am I? So Buddhism, uh, Sankhya, Yoga, even Jainism, they are, they are religions centered around the truth about ourselves. What Vedanta does is, it puts them together, it finds common ground between these two very different approaches, the God-centered approach and the approach centered around the human self. What Vedanta says is, the truth about God and the truth about ourselves is one and the same. When you search for God, what we find ultimately is ourselves. And when we search for ourselves, what we find finally, amazingly, is God. So this is the core idea of Vedanta and Vedanta holds, this is what all religions are in essence doing. The language is different, the forms, the modes of worship, the rules they, uh, they follow, the myth mythologies they believe in, they are all different and that's wonderful. Variety is, is richness and that, that, that makes our lives so much richer. But at core, this is what we are doing, a search for God, which is none other than a search for our true selves. I love the way that Swami explained Vedanta because I'm truly grateful that I found Vedanta and that it came to me. Uh, we just started doing these videos. People started to really like them and respond to them. And the more that I started watching and learning about Vedanta, about uh, these different Swamis, about these different speakers that speak on the subject, the more I began to become entranced with it. I mean, it's exactly what I've always thought and believed. As he said, once you search for yourself, you find God. And whenever he was saying that Vedanta is essentially all the religions combined, because that's what I truly believe, that all of these religions are saying the same thing. They're just different paths to God. They're, they're just different ways to God. And what Vedanta is saying is that we're all God. Everything is God. Everything is Ishvara which is something that is very beautiful to me and that I love hearing and that I love seeing and experiencing and learning more about. It's such a beautiful practice. It's such a beautiful religion, if you want to call it that. But like you said, it's all religions. So Kelly, what do you think about Vedanta? Do you like practicing it? Yeah, I'm glad I learned the term because I actually did not know the term was Vedanta, but I have to agree. Every video we watch it really deepens my understanding and it's really clarifying the things that we like to talk about and we like to ponder on uh obviously we have this channel and we're talking all about it and reacting to these videos but as he said i totally agree with that statement that the more you look into yourself the more you find the answer of god the more you look into god the more you can discover yourself and that we truly are one. One is all and all is one. And that one is God. We are part of God. We are God. God is us. We are God's children. Again, that's all different religions stemming to the same thing, just different ways of saying it. But that is the simplest way of saying the ultimate truth. And it's a great statement. You're goddamn right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, dude. And, um, it's such a beautiful religion and such a beautiful practice and philosophy that we're going to keep exploring it more, guys. If, if you like Vedanta, if you like these spiritual concepts, you're on the right page. Please spread this video. Please spread this content. Let people know and let people see this content. And let's start a movement to change. Let's start a movement to change the way people think and the way people are in reality putting out positivity. Well, Vedanta takes a very liberal, universal approach to religion. One must note that Vedanta is the core philosophy of Hinduism. The different schools of Vedanta, of course, but it's the core philosophy of Hinduism. And in the most ancient text of the Hindus, it is said in the Rig Veda, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti. The truth is one, 
but the wise speak of it differently. Now how is it possible that if the truth is one that people can express it differently? Well, if the truth is infinite and beyond human comprehension and expression, so that when we try to comprehend it and we try to express it, definitely our cultural background comes into it, our capacities of comprehension, the unique way we look at it comes into it. And so we color the expression of the truth. And this gives rise to different religions, different points of view, all of which are valid and all of which can be true, though they may appear to be contradictory. Uh, ultimately, because they lead to the same reality in different ways, uh, the, all the religions are true. Vedanta considers all religions to be true. Sri Ramakrishna, one of the greatest modern example, exemplars of Vedanta, used to say in Bengali, Jatomat Tatopat, as many opinions, as many teachings, so many paths to God. So all religions are true. They are just different expressions of, uh, uh, of the paths or different paths to uh, divinity, to, to realization. All right, so I just said that in another video that there's different paths to God. So that's why I was smiling and excited because I just, I, I really do love this so much and it means so much and it's just such an exciting concept. And I just have such a hunger and a thirst for knowledge when it comes to Vedanta and exploring it and learning what it's truly about. That's why if you're watching this channel, just just spread the information to people, you know, spread this video, spread, spread some of the videos so people can understand what it is or not even this channel, anything about Vedanta. I just want to get the word out as much as possible, but I truly do love exploring it. And um, like, like I said earlier, I do believe that all religions are different paths to God, but Vedanta is the one path that believes that everything is God which is the base and core of reality. That's one of the one of the highest truths that I believe in, that everything is God. And whenever you're walking around outside, whenever you're walking in somewhere and you know that everything is God, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's another person, whether you're talking to someone else and you can see God within them as you can see it within yourself, then you'll treat people in a different way. Then you'll treat society in a different way. Then your views and reality will be completely different than it ever was. Wow, you know, the more I watch these Vedanta videos and the more I hear their philosophies, the more I just really, really am truly aligned with it. I've always felt like that, that I felt that, as Han said as well in our one of our previous videos, that... All religions at the core are teaching all the same things and trying to have the same things. And people are just doing the best they can, whatever religion they're born into, whichever religion they practice. They're all trying to find God, be close to God and be the best child of God in the best way that they were taught how. And all religions are different. Growing up Catholic Christian, I just never agreed with that, that people who were in a different religion born into that were just automatically going to go to hell or, you know, whatever was taught, that they just weren't on the right path and can never be on the perfect path to God. And I always thought that was, just didn't make sense because why would so many millions of people, billions of people be born into the wrong religion and just automatically not gonna make it to God? So I totally agree with that. I think all religions at the core teach the same thing and everyone's just trying to get to God the best they can. And if you are trying to do that, then you deserve blessings. No, you're absolutely right. And I agree with that as well, because I would think the same thing whenever I was, you know, in church or whatever. I was mm -hmm. always thinking like that doesn't make sense that you're just going to go to hell forever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, whenever you're a kid and you hear someone's another religion, they're just going to go to hell. Right. It's like, what if they're a good person? What if they're born somewhere in some exactly. in some tribe in the middle of nowhere and they never even heard of Christianity or anything? Right. And I know some people say, well, they always have one opportunity to find them or something. I'm like, there's <laughs> some people that don't have the opportunity That's that true. have no idea that don't even speak any language. So how would they even know anything? So, 
unless they just believe that God's going to come to them or whatever Mm -hmm. they believe. But it just never made sense to me that there could be good people out there that would just, you know, burn in hell for eternity just because they practice a different religion. So... As Vedanta holds that in in our truest nature, we are not different from God. Our true nature is divine, not mortal. So the question arises that if that is so, then why do we not know it? And Vedanta says this is precisely the problem, that we are not aware of who we are. This not being aware of our true nature is called ignorance. And like any ignorance, it can be removed only by knowledge. Just as if we are ignorant of physics or computers, we need knowledge about physics or computers. Similarly, when we are ignorant about about our true nature, we need spiritual knowledge, knowledge about our true nature. Now, this knowledge is different from mere book knowledge. We can learn about our true nature from the texts of Vedanta, from the texts of different religions, but it has to become a living reality. It, it is not just theoretical knowledge, not just what you read about in, or, or listen to in a lecture, but it must become a living reality. Just as right now we feel that we are these limited bodies, we must come to a stage where we feel that we are unlimited, pure, unchanging consciousness. Now, how can that happen? Well, there are certain practices which are necessary. First of all, our minds are scattered. Even when we study, when we think deeply, our minds com- continuously get scattered in various subjects, in various, various things pull our minds towards them and away from Vedanta. So concentration of mind has to be cultivated through meditation. Meditation is one of the important practices and there are different techniques of meditation which we, uh, which we take from the yoga traditions. Then, we, another capacity that we have is for love. So love of God, love of God is to be cultivated and is a great aid in Vedanta. And finally, one thing that binds us uh, uh, greatly to our limited selves is thinking of this self as real and working for the satisfaction of our individual needs and desires. So you reverse that by working for the common good, for the greater good of humanity, unselfishly. So these are the, the, the main, the highways uh, of Vedantic practice. Selfless work, love of God, meditation, and cultivation of knowledge of our true selves. I'm not even exaggerating when I say every time I hear something on Vedanta, it, get, it just gets better and better. And I haven't heard one thing. Maybe it could happen in the future, but I haven't heard one thing yet that I disagreed with about Vedanta and what Swami has been saying about it. Because it's just so spot on. And I've been practicing Vedanta for years without even knowing it. That's why I want to spread this information to people. And if you guys spread it and you know someone like me, send them the video, let them see this because I was practicing Vedanta without even realizing it. Just having that oneness, that wholeness, that respect, that that reverence for God and everything around you, knowing that everything is God, that you are God, whoever you're talking to, whoever is watching and listening to this video is God. Having that respect for other people, doing selfless work, like what we're doing now we're not getting paid to do this okay we're not making any money we're just taking our time to educate people and spread the word and do what's right for humanity as a whole that's why i love vedanta so much and what he said about love and having that high vibration of love for god for yourself for others is such a beautiful practice that it really makes me emotional thinking about it that i've been practicing this kelly's been practicing this for so long and we haven't even realized it but now we have a name for what we've been doing and we can truly spread the word and we have ancient texts to look upon meditations to delve into it's just so much knowledge that my brain is just going a a thousand miles a minute just thinking about how much stuff we can truly just learn about, expand upon, teach on, and really delve into. It's such a beautiful process to just learn this information. Yep, it's true. I think it's safe to say that we are true Vedantaists, or whatever the term is, (laughs) Vedantaers. (laughs) Just kidding. But 
the things are just really, really good. And I love how their practice is just four simple things. And all those things are really, really connected because the more you meditate, the more you naturally will cultivate that knowledge of who you truly are because you'll have those moments of pure enlightened knowledge coming through during meditation. You'll also have those moments of pure unconditional love that will bring you to tears. And that is feeling the love of God and serving others and doing things self uh, selflessly is serving God as well because we are all God. So you are honoring God by helping others. You're helping God by helping others and helping yourself because you are God as well. And we are all brothers and sisters. That's what we truly are. And so all of these things are connected and they're all very true. And I have to tell you, Han, he says it all the time. The reason he puts so much, so much, so much work into these videos, into this channel, and he truly just does it to help people. That's all he wants. He wants to spread this knowledge and he wants to help people with his guided meditations. And he's always said from the beginning, if one single person is has a better life or is just helped in some type of way from doing this work, it is all worth it to him. And that's beautiful. And I really look up to him for that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's what we're doing this for, to just help people and if one person sees us, if one person is inspired, if one person changes their life and that that would mean the world to me because that love, that gratitude, that information that you're spreading spirals and through that one person turns into a million people. So imagine if we could just spread this message to a million people, how many more people will get this information and how it will compound and how the world will become a better place and how vibrations will change and expand from this moment on. It's just such an awesome and incredible process that we're grateful to even be here with you guys. Very interesting boy. Uh, he's from IIT Kharagpur and then he's from IIM Calcutta. Huh? Uh, from IIM Calcutta. And instead of going in for uh, a corporate career, like all his batchmates, what he decided to do was take care of orphan children. Parivar, if you Google him, you'll find Parivar some stuff. Mm. Take care uh, of orphan chicken. With three children from the street he picked up. Now he has more than children. 1, and a very a big organization a few years got ago he got the president's award for child welfare and so on anyway the point is one day in talking to a group like this somebody asked him a question one young person asked him a question how did you decide to do this your goal in life it's a great thing you're doing how did you decide to do this you know what he said he is a very thoughtful young person he said they go i did not decide to do this what should I do with my life? You see, what is the goal of your life? I said, we will scratch our head and think. Goal, we will say. Now you see the intelligence of that person. What did he do? Unko bhi laga ki, aisa to khas kuch kya karenge, aisa pata nahi chal then he decided, let me think, kya nahi karenge? He made a list. I say your multinational corporate career to attract Kazai. No. To ye jo professor, either a management ke researcher, scholars, who banoge? No. Teacher banoge? No. I say Kakeka under Sikya Chan he like that. Kurte, 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 suddenly it came out from within. Ye Kareka. When you clearly cut out ye Nikarna, it doesn't come from within. Under say there is no inspiration to do this. When you keep on thinking that way, then something will come out from within that this is what I would like to do. Now, it may change later in future. Now I would like to do this. And he said, I want to do something for others. Another person asked him a question. Just see how he thinks. Another person asked him a question. How did you get this idea of taking care of young children? And then he said, I did not start with an idea. I started with a feeling. See, great work starts with feeling. So I'm Vivekananda says, head, heart and hand, but most important heart. He says, if you can feel like a Buddha, you will be a Buddha. If you can feel like a Christ, you will be a Christ. Feeling first, not the idea. Idea comes later on. I felt deeply for the suffering of little children. 
Then I thought, what can I do? Then one idea came. Then he executed it. So starts with a feeling, not starts with an idea. Normally management teaching will teach you that you take a great idea and then work it out. It's an intellectual approach. This is a, an approach from the heart. I really like that video because what he's explaining and what he's talking about is if you don't know what life path you're on, the most important thing to do is start with a feeling and what do you want to do? Do you want to help others? What makes you feel good? What would take your life and make it meaningful? So if you feel like you're helping people and you're making a difference, that's why we started this channel because we want to help people make a difference and that makes us feel good. So that's why we started doing this. That's why we take all this time in this production and making the studio and talking to you guys and recording and editing videos and picking topics and, you know, responding to commenters and then going back and forth. And that's why we do it, because it makes us feel good that we're helping people. And we didn't know what we wanted to do. It was the same thing with me. I didn't know that this is what this was going to turn into. It started with the feeling. It first started with watching the ce5 by stephen greer talking about meditation and contacting extraterrestrial beings i said oh that makes sense i started meditating i started seeing ufos i started seeing different beings i started getting different messages i saw the spirit of krishna i saw yeshua i saw all different beings and had enlightening experiences but i didn't know that it was going to turn into this i just started telling kelly my wife about my meditation experiences and she said you should start meditating you should start making a meditation channel because your experiences are nothing like mine and you should start making guided meditation so that's what i started to do i started to channel them everything started spiraling and bringing me to where i am now to which i'm talking about vedanta and spreading the word of vedanta I didn't know where I was going to start in the beginning, but I had that feeling that I wanted to change something. I wanted to make a difference. I knew that this was my life purpose to start meditating and starting down that path of meditation. And it changed my entire reality by starting with that feeling and then figuring out the rest through synchronicity, through God, through my wife, through my loved ones, through love and harmony. You can figure out what you're going to do next. Yeah, I mean... Our heart is the truest part of us. It is our direct connection to the divine, to God, and to our own soul. That's why even little decisions, sometimes you'll be weighing two options and you know in your heart what it's truly, what you truly want. And it really reminds me of the principle taught by Bashar, who we really love as well, the principle of excitement, that you have to follow whatever is most exciting to you. Starting with the simplest, simplest, simplest of things, you wake up, you ask yourself, what sounds better, a tea or a coffee? And you go with that one. And then the more you do it, the more you align with these things that sound exciting and the more you will naturally gravitate towards them and the easier you will hear them in your ear of, of what sound truly is the most exciting. And it will naturally and synchronistically lead you on the path you're meant to go on because we are all souls. We do have some destiny in us that our soul signed up to do and wanted to accomplish and wanted to learn in this life. And typically our life path or our career is going to be aligned with that. So your soul already knows, God already knows. You just have to listen to your heart because that is a direct line to God, to the divine, to your soul. You're absolutely right, Kelly. And you just have to keep listening to your excitement, listening to God and listening to your higher mind and it will come in perfect timing. Please spread this video. Please spread this content. Let people know and let people see this content and let's start a movement to change. Let's start a movement to change the way people think and the way people are in reality, putting out positivity. Thank you guys for watching. Absolutely. People need this information. It is so good. It's so positive. So share it, like it, comment it, share it with everyone you know that could use it, which is everyone. And if you did like this video, definitely check out these videos on the screen. You will love those. Make sure you're subscribed and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Swami Vivekananda talks about the importance of self-confidence, having faith in one's, in oneself. The power of having faith in oneself. Swami Vivekananda said, the old religion says, he who does not believe in God is a Gnostic atheist. But the, today's religion says, he, who, he or she who does not believe in herself is an atheist. Mm, I love that.
if you believe in God, very good. But if you do not believe in yourself, you are an atheist. Mm. Swami Vivekananda says, never tell yourself that I cannot. Always say, I can, I can. I can do it. What others have done, you can do. What others have not been able to do, one day you also may be able to do that. So, this faith in oneself, that I can do it. It seems the great um, industrialist, Ford, vehicles, cars, Henry Ford. It seems he said once, um, if you think I can, you are right, you can. If you think I cannot, you are right, you cannot. So, depending upon your belief in yourself, sometimes I tell the children the importance of faith in yourself. You know, Mercedes vehicle, very powerful, BMW, Mercedes or whatever, very powerful vehicle. But if the driver puts his foot on the accelerator and also on the brake, accelerator and the brake, what will happen to the vehicle? It will not move. Uh, engine will raise big noise, a lot of noise will come out, but the vehicle will not move. In fact, a small auto, that will move faster. It is just like that in our lives. If we do not have confidence in ourselves, faith in ourselves, the belief that I can, it is just like putting your foot on the brake. You will not be able to use your talent, your abilities, your cap capacities, if you do not have faith in yourself. That was absolutely masterfully said and beautiful information right there. I'm going to start saying that and using that. If you don't believe in yourself, you're an atheist. That's the most powerful thing I've heard in a while. If you don't believe in yourself, you're an atheist. And I'm going to take what Swami said at the end even farther because I drive a manual car. So imagine if I just press on the gas, turn the car and press on the gas, I wouldn't go anywhere. Because guess what? If you're driving a manual car, you have to be in gear to go somewhere and you have to be in first gear. Then you go faster. Second gear, you go faster. Third gear, faster. Fourth, faster. Fifth gear, you go fast. And guess what's coming out today? One piece, Luffy, fifth gear. That's the day we're filming this. So, of course, my car has six, is a six speed manual. So there's six gears. But I just wanted to mention that for the one piece fans out there. So, this whole idea that if you don't believe in yourself, you're an atheist is absolutely correct. And I say all the time, the, the other quote he said, well, if you say you can or you can't, you're right either way. If you say, yes, I can do it, you're right. You're right. If you say, no, I can't, you're right. I have friends that said, no, I can't do it. I can't. I'm like, you're right. You can't do it because you're telling yourself you can't do it. So I'm not going to argue with you whether you can or you can. If you're telling me you can't do it, then you can't do it. If you're telling me, hey, I can do this, I can do this, and I believe you, you can do it. And that's why I said, if someone else can do it, then you can do it. And that gave me chills. And even if someone hasn't done it, then you can still do it and be the person to do it. Because once you do it, it unlocks a whole new realm of belief. A new belief system unlocks within the consciousness, the collective consciousness of reality and society in which they start to believe that they can do something once you do it. It's just like no one could run a four minute mile. And then someone did it. And then like 10 other people broke the same record the same year because one person did it. And then once that one person did it, everyone else realized that they can do it too. You can do anything that you say you can do. If you say you can or you can't, you're right either way. So stop saying you can't and start saying you can and start getting into gear in your life so that you can go places and putting yourself into gear means that you're doing the things that you would be doing that you need to do to go forward. You're not just pressing the gas. You're putting yourself into gear to go forward and then changing gears. Once you max out the first gear, you have to switch gears to the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth gear. And then the faster you go until you're just in the sixth gear, in the last gear with that momentum, with that momentum carrying you to your destination. Yeah, that was such a good phrase. I never, ever would have thought of that. And I like your car analogy too, because in the beginning when you're switching gears, which I learned how to drive the manual car too. She can drive manual, guys. She's, <laughs> she's, 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 pretty, she's pretty badass. You got to give it to her. <laughs> I taught her too. Right, of course. So in the beginning, you're going up the gears, going up the gears, going up the gears. But once you finally reach your last gear, the sixth gear, fifth gear, whichever you're going to stay at, 
you're just it's just the exact same as driving a regular car you're just pressing on the gas braking when you gotta brake but in the beginning it seems scary because oh my god it's what these gears what's with these gears and when you're learning you're like oh wow once i get to this gear it's literally just like regular driving because as you said you're just going off that momentum but that line about if you don't believe in yourself you're an atheist that's so clever i would never think of that but again it reminds me of also what bashar says we love him as well and he says that how does he put it that if you believe that you are unworthy then that means it's basically like you're saying you're the most special person in the universe because you wouldn't exist if you're not worthy yeah it's like the hubris right, right, of you yeah. to say something like that exactly. it's almost that that you have to believe that you're the only person, you're yeah, the only exactly, one. Exactly. You have to believe that out of all the people, the infinite people, the billions of people, mm -hmm. you're just so special. You're just so different that only you can do these things. You're the only one that can accomplish these things out of all the people that exist. Yeah. That's that's his whole thing. That it's it's just the hubris and and the, and the cockiness. That, that you would have to believe in yourself right. to, to even believe that you can't do something. You would have to believe that you're so different. You're so special. You're the only one to the point that you're believing in a false reality. That's even more ridiculous than just believing that you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're no different than anybody else. Exactly. And so it just comes down to that. You are worthy of anything you want. You are good enough and you deserve to be here you're here for a reason you are part of god and you should just love yourself there's no reason to not love yourself because god loves you more than you could ever even imagine so it's so true if you don't believe in yourself you're you're not believing in god you're absolutely right kelly when bhagavan buddha after getting his realization when he was walking towards sarnath so it seems a shepherd boy saw him and asked him what are you Houston Smith, in his book, The Religions of the World, he says that many people have been asked, who are you? Many people have been asked this question. We have also been asked this question. But what are you? Very few people in history have been asked this question. Are you a god? Buddha said no. Are you an angel? Buddha said no. Are you a human being? Buddha said no. Then what are you? And he said, I am the awakened, I am the Buddha. Now what he means is, he is awake, he has awakened, we are in a dream. We are in a dream. And what is this dream? One aspect of this dream is instinctual living. Jaisa mera habit hai, jaisa mera man bahaja hai, usi tarah se jee hai. That's a dream. So I am Vivekananda's famous Arise, Awake and uh, stop, stop. stop Not Till the Goal is Reached. It is from Kathopanishad. Uttishtata Uttishtata Jagrata Prabhupada Jagrata Prabhupada Jagrata Prabhupada Jagrata There, if you look at the Bhashya given by Shankaracharya, Uttishtata Jagrata Prabhupada Jagrata Prabhupada He says, Arise from the sleep of Maya. Anadi Agyana Avachinna. Uh, anadi uh, Agyana. Beginningless Maya. We are sleeping in that dream. Yeah, we, are, we, we are dreaming in that sleep. Sleep of Maya. Awake from that. From the sleep of ignorance. And towards self knowledge. And go to the teacher. Varan means the great teachers, and you get knowledge from them. So, one of my favorite quotes is I am all that I am. And if you say that quote, then you just feel this power. I am all that I am. I am. Even if you just say the words, I am, you can feel the power emanating from that statement alone. Those two words carry immense power by just saying, I am, you feel that power because you're stating who you are. So if you're saying, I am wealthy. And you're stating it as a fact. I am happy. You're stating it as a fact. I am healthy. You're stating it as a fact. And even better, if you say, I am healthy now. I am happy now. 
<laughs> well, someone someone just dropped something. That's how I'm like someone just dropped something outside of our office. It sounded expensive too. I am wealthy now because you realize that all time is now. So if you're saying I am happy now, then you're saying I am happy throughout all time. If you're saying I'm healthy now, same thing. Throughout all time, I am healthy at all times, throughout all time. And that is what I am. So whenever you say that, you feel that power. So that's why when Buddha said, I am awakened, he's saying, I am not a God. I am not human, whatever. I'm just an awakened being. I am just awakened because he's not defining himself by his body. He's not defining himself as a human being by his body. By And, and I don't know how this is translated. A lot of times the translations get you know, mixed up over time. Even if you're the story, you know, someone hears a story and it's a, a oratory story over years and it, it's being told by voice over years and years, it's going to get misconstrued. And then, it, you know, if it's an old language, it's gonna, the translation might be off. But basically what I'm getting is that he's saying it as I am not my body. And you're not your mind. You're not your body. You're so much more than your body. And just saying those affirmations of I am, you will feel that power within you and you'll feel that power and you'll know that power to go on within you throughout all time. Yes, because saying these things as right now, I mean, all we really have is the present moment. So it's really powerful to say these affirmations and say these words of confirmation in the present tense, because that is what we have. It's all we ever have in any given moment. And also, I mean, it's very, very true that we can be here living, existing, but it really is like we're asleep until we really start to open up our eyes, our third eye, and realize what we truly are and what this existence really truly is. It's just like being in a dream where you feel like everything around you is real. It's going on and this is what it is. And then we can wake up and realize, wow, that was all a dream. I was existing. My body was doing all the bodily functions of being alive, but I was not awake. I could not see. And that's all we really need to do. We don't need to be, and we can all access that by doing our daily practices. We don't need to be gods. We just are ourselves and we just need to see what we truly are. You're absolutely right, Kelly. And also right now, I want to give a shout out because we did have a donation to the channel. Oh, yeah. So, um, okay. So right now we have from, I hope I'm pronouncing this name correctly. If I'm not, please forgive me. But Boxar uh, Susarla, thank you so much for donating, man. That You'd have no idea what that means to us to donate because we're not doing this to make any money. But this stuff costs money to be putting these videos forward. So thank you so much for donating. We truly appreciate you more than you could have ever even imagined. And we're going to do something where we're going to put your name in the description or at the end of the video or something. But we're going to do something special for you. And if you have any suggestions, we'll make that happen for you. So thank you so much, man. We definitely appreciate your donation and we appreciate you. And we're sending you love and positivity throughout all time thank you thank you very very much it was happens you know if you try to settle down i have understood vedanta i am brahman if you try to settle down there what will happen thoughts keep coming to the mind simple swami prabhavananda ji in his book sermon on the mount according to vedanta when he's talking about Blessed are the pure of heart, for down. they shall see God. He says, try this. What do you mean by pure of, of heart? How do I know I'm not pure of heart? Try this. Make up your mind. I'm going to think about God. Only about God and nothing else. In whatever form you're used to. Settle down seriously, quietly and try it. Within a minute. Within a minute. Within two minutes. You will find other thoughts crowding. Almost all people have this experience. This is the sign of the impurity of the heart. That's really interesting because if you are pure of heart, I guess you would just think of God and only God at all times. And you'd be on that high vibration of God. And I like that what he said about the book, because whenever he mentions stuff like that, I'm like, yo, I'm going to go research that book and I'm going to go buy it and read it. 
And then I'll have more information to tell you guys because I'm always in a constant state of learning and obtaining knowledge. And that's why if you guys are watching this channel, you guys like learning too. You guys like serving God. You guys like, you know, gaining new knowledge. And right now I'm actually listening to lectures about uh, Voltaire, um, who was alive in the 18th century in uh, France and in England as well. And he was a great philosopher and he was a part of the Enlightenment movement in France. So it's very interesting to learn about him. And I'm also learning about lectures about uh, France and the time of Napoleon and the revolution. So I just like learning about all different information and knowledge. And you'll never know when you need this knowledge and when it'll come to you. But what Swami says is that is a good test. If you're pure heart, you say, I'm going to think about God and God only. And then you're only going to think about God. And then it's in just saying, I'm going to think about one thing. Your mind will naturally wonder to different topics and different things, but it is really good and uh, awesome to be a part of that meditation. Because even when I meditate, I'm going to try it tonight, but whenever I try and think of one thing, I pretty much do think of one thing. So I started this channel just to help other people. And I said, if even one person hears it and enjoys what I'm saying and it changes them, then that's all I need. Because the butterfly effect says that changing one person will change the entire world. So we're all changing the world, just watching this video, just spreading this information. So like the video and spread it if you truly like hearing this kind of information. And I can't wait to read this book guys sermon on the mount about vedanta Ooh, i'm gonna read this i'm gonna do a full review i'm actually reading Sadhguru's book as well right now and it's really interesting hearing how he was always kind of a, a, a spatial thinker and a different thinker even as a kid and never really liked going to school and he was always in deep thought and had these deep meditations where he felt oneness upon the world and i love that kind of information and knowledge and, and hearing and learning about these people because once you learn about these great people, then you can become great yourself because they give you a blueprint for who you can become. So, Kelly, what do you think about being pure of heart? And do you think it, is there any other tests that you can do? Do you just believe in meditation and, and listening to it or or what? It's, it's an interesting topic to talk about for sure. Yeah, that was a good point he made. I never would have thought of it in that way, but it definitely makes sense. And, you know, if you do go to meditate or just focus on God and you do get distracted, I mean, that's okay. You just have to do it more often. And, you know, the way that we form new habits and change our ways is by having that discipline and making ourselves do it more and more and more and more until it does become natural, just like forming a new habit. And we also do A Course of Miracles, you know, the daily lessons, and it's constantly, 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 these daily lessons are saying, okay, at the top of every hour for one minute, just focus on God for 10 minutes in a day, focus on God for half an hour. And it's always, always, always focusing on God and having more gratitude and just strengthening your heart for God. And yep. it's just that, just what I just said. It's having that discipline, doing it more and more and more until it does become second nature natural mm. so that you can have that pure of heart. You're just strengthening it more and more and more. So if that happens, I mean, that's normal. Of course, I get distracted during meditations at times. We all do. So just do it more and more and it will be better for you. Yeah, practice makes perfect. So the more you practice it, And the more you practice it in your life about the other video, how we just talked about, you can honor God in everything you do. Even when you're working, whenever you're out doing whatever you're doing, you can be honoring God. So practicing that and honoring God in every single way will then translate to you becoming more pure of heart. So if you want to be more pure of heart, then you have to figure out how you can honor God in every single thing you do. And knowing that everything is God, everything is Ishvara, you should be honoring everything and everything you do. And that is the perfect sweet spot. Everything is Ishvara. So if you honor everything and you honor everything and everything you do, then you become pure of heart. One of the most interesting places I ever gave a talk was... I was coming through Lucknow Airport once and uh, in India. At night, I was the transit passenger. And this, you know, they have this, like TSA here in the United States, you have the CISF uh, police security people there. One sergeant saw me, I was dressed like this, and he said, Swamiji, kuch bolye. Swamiji, tell us something, give us a talk. I said, yeah, here. <laughs> so yes, there, you know, they make you stand on top of a box and they pat you down. 
So they made me stand on top of a box and he called the others. There are no passengers. So they all come with guns and all they are standing. Kuch boli hai, tell me a talk. Guns at the airport? Thought, what talk I will give here? That's what's up. Then I asked him that, Aap ghar se nikalne se pehle puja karke nikalte hai? When you, it's UP, so Uttar Pradesh. We would do, you do puja before leaving the house. And the gentleman, very sincere, simple person. He said, Haji, Hanuman ji ko phul chadate hai. Before leaving the house, I put flowers at the feet of Lord Hanuman. And I said, See, as these passengers go in front of you, check them um, firmly, politely, and each one you pass, mentally put one more flower at the feet of Lord Hanuman, Anjaneya. Like this you do. He was so happy. Simple person, you see, simple heart. Immediately he liked the idea. He said, Are wah, din bhar Hanuman ji ka puja. Whole day I can worship Lord Hanuman. Yes, you can. This is the crucial idea of Karma Yoga. Now see the power of Karma Yoga. So what is the basic idea? Two components. All my work I can do as worship of the Lord. It's puja. So whatever will come to me in life will become prasad. And with that detachment. Uh, that my, I am here to do the puja only. I am not here to get the prasad. Hmm. So uh, that detachment with the results of the work. If you can combine puja attitude with detachment of the results of the work, it becomes karma yoga. Wow. I mean, honestly, dude, like I'm tearing up a little bit just from hearing that because it's just so beautiful. And um, it's exactly what Kelly and I have been experiencing and going through where she was just saying in another video, I just said like we she got a message during a Reiki session that was saying that in everything you do, you should basically be um, almost like worshiping God. Worship isn't the right word, but you know, everything you do should be Connecting, honoring God. Yeah, honor. So, and it's just like, whenever he said that and the guy was so happy and excited to honor God, that's exactly what I started feeling and thinking. And it was saying like, you, it, the message was basically saying like, we see doing this channel and spreading this information as honoring God. But it's not only the channel, it's in everything you do. So everything you do, you should be honoring God. And that's very, you know, interesting and insightful. And it just really connected to me when Kelly said that. And then it connected to me whenever Swami just said that just now. And he just gave an impromptu speech at an airport that he didn't even know he was going to be speaking at and just <laughs> related it perfectly back to the guy in his life and what he was doing. And it just would make everyone's interaction so much better if they're thinking that they're worshiping by doing this service to the people and putting a flower on them. And it's almost like a flower of protection and, and holiness. And it's just so beautiful to be in that mindset where everything you're doing, you're honoring God. And it's it really is crazy that I pick these videos randomly, not randomly, but just what interests me. I, I see this and I see that. And this one just talked about the airport. I didn't know that it just sounded interesting to me. And I didn't know that he was going to say that at all. And just mm -hmm. seeing that and seeing him say that after we have just been talking about this, it's just so amazing. And the synchronicity of it, it just lets me know that this is 100% what I'm supposed to be doing is spreading this information, this knowledge. That's why I've been going so hard spreading it. And I want you guys to spread it too and share the video and just like the video and comment. And that'll help us so much. That's all you need to do. Just like it and comment. If you want to go the extra mile, then share the video. Kelly, what did you think about that? Yeah, that was really nice because, you know, we can often just get caught up in, oh, it's work and, you know, start to get a bad attitude or if not, maybe just a neutral attitude and we're not very excited. We're not really looking forward to it. We're not really seeing ourselves as making a big difference or anything like that. But even small things like that, you never know just a smile, a compliment, even a thought, a positive thought towards someone, how it can truly, truly change their day and the, even the course of their lives as it ripples, as a little drop onto water, it ripples, 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 ripples. And we don't know how much we can affect people with that. And there really is an opportunity with that, with everything that we do. And we really don't realize how powerful our thoughts are. Just an intentional thought is so, 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 so powerful. 
And it really was good. I really liked hearing that. And it also reminds me of one of the Reiki books I read. She said that when she does distance Reiki for people, what she imagines is basically the same thing. She just imagines like sending them a, a flower and that's how she does her distance Reiki. So it reminds me of that as well. And all of these things are connected. So basically doing that is just a very strong intentional energy essentially like sending reiki to someone and it really is powerful just to have that intentional thought for someone yeah and you're very attuned with flowers too mm -hmm. so i mean look at your dress you're wearing flowers right now <laughs> i love flowers yeah so, <laughs> i mean this is the synchronicity of it all guys and kelly's very in tune with flowers and she's very intuitive she's a, a very feminine healer and it's a beautiful energy to have around me and for you guys to hear her talk and hear her energy it really does make me happy as well to share her light as well as mine as well and it's just such a beautiful process we're truly enjoying it guys and thank you for being on this journey with us we're going to learn more we're going to try and be as knowledgeable as we can throughout this process Please spread this video, please spread this content. Let people know and let people see this content and let's start a movement to change. Let's start a movement to change the way people think and the way people are in reality, putting out positivity. Thank you guys for watching. Absolutely, people need this information. It is so good, it's so positive. So share it, like it, comment it, share it with everyone you know that could use it, which is everyone. And if you did like this video, definitely check out these videos on the screen. You will love those. Make sure you're subscribed and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.